The guy tasked with investigating the missing texts from the Secret Service is a man named Joseph Kafari. He's the Department of Homeland Security Inspector General, and he has quite a troubling history when it comes to investigations. Back in 2012, he was in charge of a Department of Justice Inspector General field office in Arizona. A government report found that he failed to let the assistant U.S. attorney and his own supervisors know about a, quote, prisoner's request for his testimony, violating Department of Justice regulations. And he broke more regulations when he, quote, provided the prisoner's mother with the names of his friend's law firms. The Washington Post reports that as the DOJ was deciding if it would investigate him, quote, he quickly retired and joined the administration of then Arizona Republican Governor Jan Brewer as a policy advisor for public safety. In 2019, he was nominated by Donald Trump to become the Homeland Security Watchdog. As Inspector General, he directed his staff to, quote, tread lightly on the conduct of former political appointees in his own party to avoid embarrassing them when investigators uncovered mismanagement or misconduct, according to the Post. He declined to investigate the Secret Service role in clearing Lafayette Square or the treatment of Haitian migrants at the border. And, of course, most recently, he failed to notify Congress about the deleted January 6th Secret Service texts and did not try to recover them. And so all of this begs the question, nearly two years into the Biden administration, why does this very controversial Trump appointee still have his job? Congressman Mondaire Jones is a Democrat representing New York's 17th Congressional District. He joins me now. Congressman, President Biden made a pledge before he took office not to fire any inspectors general. And late this afternoon, the White House press secretary confirmed that the DHS watchdog will not be fired. Do you agree with that? Given what we know, shouldn't people like Kafari be out on their ear? What happened to accountability? I think that's right, Mehdi. And, and this is part of a broader problem. Uh, we also have an attorney general who until recently thought it would have been too inappropriate to investigate the former president of the United States, who we know incited the violent insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, there's got to be more accountability for some of the personnel making up this administration. Uh, and I know that the president wants to do the right thing. I think that there may be people around him who may be advising him to, to not do that. And so we've got to make sure that, that we hold his feet to the fire, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure what Louis DeJoy is still doing running the post office, but there you go. Look, sticking with the 1-6 story, there is new reporting that Donald Trump's legal team is, quote, in direct communication with Justice Department officials. He seems worried, concerned. Do you think Trump should have been subpoenaed by now, if not by the 1-6 committee, then by the DOJ? You mentioned Merrick Garland a moment ago. Would you like to see a more aggressive stance against a man who seems to be using his former president status as a kind of legal and political shield? Mehdi, as you know, our democracy is in crisis. And the idea that any person, even a former president of the United States, would be above the law is counter to what we know to be, to be true about what democracy should look like. No one gets a pass, certainly not a guy who we've got voluminous evidence on. Uh, and it cannot be the case that the January 6th committee somehow has more evidence than the United States Department of Justice with all of its resources. Uh, this is a real problem. Whenever someone in leadership, and now I'm talking about Merrick Garland, uh, decides to, to elevate his own personal views uh, in this case, it being the, it being a concern that uh, somehow it would be political, too political to investigate and indict the former president of the United States uh, and, and elevate that over what justice requires, including what the future of our democracy, I think, requires. Because this guy is out here and Donald Trump is the person I'm talking about now, still a de facto leader of the Republican Party, is still inciting violence, talking about running for reelection. Uh, evading, having evaded all accountability thus far for the, his conduct yeah. uh, and, and, and there being nothing to sort of prevent him from doing the same thing all over again. And this is personal for me, obviously, as someone who lived through that violent insurrection and who nearly died at the Capitol on January 6th, only to see two thirds of my House Republican colleagues vote hours later not to certify that free and fair presidential election from 2020. So let's switch gear a bit. Let's talk about what's going on in Congress. We are expecting a vote soon on the big budget reconciliation bill, the quote unquote Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, were you surprised to see Senator Sinema, the lone holdout, suggesting she wants the rule to close the carried interest loophole, which benefits 
finance guys removed from the bill. We need better people in Congress, Mehdi, uh, whether in the House or in the United States Senate. Uh, I believe we will get this reconciliation bill done. Uh, it is not surprising to me that someone who has done Wall Street's bidding before, including last fall, during those dramatic negotiations over Build Back Better and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, is now causing problems again, where even Joe Manchin has signed off on a transformative piece of legislation. It is certainly not everything that we passed last fall in the House of Representatives, but we are talking about allowing Medicare to negotiate the cost of prescription drugs and cap the annual cost of prescription drugs at $2,000 a year. We are talking about unprecedented climate action uh, to the tune of approximately $370 billion to help us reduce our carbon emissions by 40% by the year 2030 while creating millions of good paying union jobs over the next decade. Uh, and of course, yes, raising more money than we spend, which has the opposite effect of inflation. Uh, there is no good reason why, and folks on Wall Street will tell you this even uh, if they're being honest and typically in private conversation, why there should still be this carried interest loophole. We can raise revenue by making folks on Wall Street pay their fair share. And in particular, we're yes. just talking about being taxed at the rate of ordinary income in the same way someone working at McDonald's would be, for example. Yeah, it's a, it's a problem. Cinema is always a problem, it seems. You said it's a transformative bill, and it is. You outlined why. As a progressive, though, do you have any concerns about any of the contents of the bill? Senator Bernie Sanders, for example, uh, said yesterday that he wants to amend it to remove all the giveaways that are in there for fossil fuel industries, which were presumably put in there to keep Joe Manchin on board. Look, I've got issues with some of the permitting provisions uh, contained in, in, the, in the draft text. Uh, but here's the thing. We are on the cusp of doing something transformative. Uh, it is certainly the case that the good in this legislation outweighs the bad. Uh, it's why you've got organizations like Sunrise Movement endorsing this legislation as well. It doesn't mean that we can't fight to improve it between now and final passage. Uh, but I want to be very clear that a lot of what is in this legislation is what we fought so hard for last fall. And I'm proud that we have gotten to this moment. It's a shame that it's taken this long. And there's a lot of other stuff, including the universal childcare provisions that I co-authored that we did get in the House version last fall uh, that I'm going to be fighting to get in a, future, in, a, in a future Build Back Better or whatever we decide to call it. Uh, but in the meantime, this is an incredible piece of legislation. Quick last question. Lots of your colleagues keep getting this question. You're going to get it too. Do you think Joe Biden should be running for re-election in 2024? Will you support him when he does, if he does? I think Joe Biden should do whatever he wants to do. If he feels uh, that he's in a position to, to win the presidency again in 2024, uh, then that is a, a situation that everyone should evaluate at the appropriate time. Uh, but I think that he needs to continue to be allowed to do his job on behalf of the American people. You know, the economic policies that he is advancing right now, including in this upcoming Inflation Reduction Act, uh, these, these things are broadly popular with the American people. They are going okay. to lower the costs of working folks, and I'm going to be proud to support that legislation. I'm going to take that as a maybe he should. Congressman Mondaire Jones, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. 